Hello everyone, today we talk about the Rhineland Ministeriales uh, of the county of Ar under the Count Dietrich, that was a vassal of the Archbishop of Cologne. We see this from the surviving costumes right, of uh, Cologne. There are some of the most um, insightful uh, and uh, properly available, right, well um, preserved of the period. We're in the mid uh, 12th century at the rise of Frederick Barbarossa in this region that stretch the Ar Valley that stretches today's uh, German states of North Rhine-Westphalian uh, the Rhineland Palatinate. We'll have to make more about the Rhineland. I realize that yes I made something about Cologne but there is plenty actually especially the Palatinate but also in fact the archbishopric of, of Cologne like being musts for our historical regional series. This was one of the most developed um, areas in Europe. The Art Valley is sort of uh, like a little heaven, right, uh, that allows to, uh, for example, cultivate the, um, the wine yards. It has um, this milder climate that is also, in many ways, if you look at the boundary of, of the Roman Empire, right, it follows essentially this uh, climatic areas, like the uh, the the Europe of, of the wine is, is is the Europe of, of the Romans. And this territory has um, right, a significant uh, importance. We'll see it in a, uh, also in other videos. Today we talk mostly about the ministeriales and uh, essentially their rights and duties uh, towards Count Dietrich of Haar. Um, why is this important? We've seen already in some videos, for example, how the, the ministerialist succession worked, how like all the various, um, uh, let's say, uh, instances in which these German servant knights, as you know, uh, could find themselves and exactly in virtue of this quite um, unique uh, status in Europe, right? The German knighthood is, uh, of course, in part also free. Um, and there is a nobility, there are free knights, etc. But especially in the ecclesiastical principalities and in southern Germany, but also in the west, like in this case, the ministerialists are rising right fast. They will actually surpass in number the same free knights, right? And this had been rendered possible by the um, fact the the most evident issue that as serfs they could not technically inherit. Um, it's a as freemen, uh, the uh, the the family's possessions, just like at least under the same conditions of the freemen, right? And this allows their masters, their owners, as a matter of fact, to not just dispose of them quite um, you know quite freely, quite um, uh, dirigistically, let's say, but also given that these knights at the end of the day did absolve the, the same functions like of the of the free ones still endowing them with some powers just by you know lordly or at some point even imperial right authority because not just because the imperial law was controlling the entire system hierarchically but because the empire public authority uh, in practice in germany the uh, the the private possessions as however uh, demand, public demand, of the uh, ruling houses would make uh, an incredibly large use of these uh, these knights, right? Because by elevating them in terms of practical power to the retinues of the, uh, the free ones, uh, they could counter uh, the latter, right, in a country like Germany that, as you know, had this sort of chronic difficulty in power concentration. Uh, it was an elective monarchy, but eventually in the 13th century sort of explode in that regard. These are actually some of the, this is the moment in which the, um, the Germanic Empire is uh, at its peak, right, the second half of, of the 12th century. So even looking at this time and observing how, like, uh, like literally the, the strongest power uh, in Western Europe would 
uh, leverage power through this essentially private mechanism uh, still a dynastic part from the same servile uh, ministerialis is quite fascinating because in many ways it all worked um, along the same pattern and quantities let's say of the um, let's say the three knights right in terms as like having a, a knight in the first place like the, 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 entrusting him with uh, enough land that could sustain his military capacity in the first place uh, so here we are within the Archbishopric of Cologne as um, at least in vassalatic relations the count district of uh, response to the arch the, the most powerful archbishop um, in Germany and he issued a, a customal that uh, in 1154 the same year of Frederick Barbarossa's election um, disciplines the ministerialis rights and duties so guaranteeing from one side but also demanding from another right so this describe this, this costume it's again a, essentially a list of customs that had already existed that now are formalized right in the second half of the 12th century you have a lot of um let's say uh, development and as a consequence a um, necessity to write things down in a more orderly fixed way and the costumal essentially describes the thieves held by the ministerialis um, and the discipline attached to them, right? So the thieves here we're talking uh, are essentially just like beneficia, right? Like the other, like any other uh, vassal would get. Uh, what differs, of course, with the ministerialis is the fact that he legally is not a freeman but in terms of practical again like i will prepay your military service by installing you into a castle and lording over some some land it's the same exact mechanism and as we were just saying like the military functionality of the ministerialis is tied to that in, in the first like any other any other knight because there weren't technical differences a ministerialis was identical as a knight in everything to a, a free uh, knight right um for this reason and that's why the two proceedings really the respective proceedings really are uh, quite the same the thieves were hereditary to sons right in the case the ministerialis did not have a son and again also genealogically in terms of rights so this followed the, the same pattern of the freeman um you would the uh, daughters would inherit that. I made a video about the ministerialis female inheritance, female lineage, um, that is not to be underestimated at all, especially considering the again very the much more exchangeably dynamic um levels of um you know the same ministerialis like the resettlement there um, the way the lords could simply arrange whatever condition they wanted in terms of like if there were entire families that were moved from one place in Germany to another of course their loyalty was tied to how well they would have been treated of course there were rebellious ministerialists that's something we will have to look at some other point but generally speaking these guys by being serfs and de facto having it the wars in the outer world um, than uh, than other guys, if they hadn't had their um, lord's protections, and even maybe just by name, because some of them lived even hundreds of kilometers away um, from their sponsors, especially in these times, they would be fanatically loyal to their masters. Right? It's a bit like the same concept of different. Um, you know, in that case, it would be outsiders. But if you look at the Mamluks, for example, like in how like the, this concept of, of military servant, right, would eventually be elevated to a higher status, even on the free um, knights, not even just the free men, the free, the free warriors. Like you can understand the um, you know the importance of of these guys and how founded their their connection with their masters um, really was, right. So then you have daughters in the in the uh, lineage of uh, inheritance, daughters over the brothers of the deceased. This is really uh, really interesting, and sisters as well. 
<laughs> now, if a ministerialist died without no thieves as yet, because the ministerialist, as we'll see now, was not meant even just to have a thief uh, in the first place, then the Harriet, that was essentially this um, uh, exception, this um, uh, death tax like of sort, which you had to provide to your lord at your death, uh, your own spoils, meant as the this polyopium, as the, the equipment, right? Sometimes also the horse, right? This was a the system you find among the Anglo-Saxons, among the French, like it's not nothing um, revolutionary. So it was owed because technically the idea was that what was, especially in these, uh, in the case of these servants, uh, not really yours. Like they, they could be a peculium or something, but the means to to fight as a knight had been provided you through the imperium of your lord, the Count of Ar, in, the, in this case, right? So. The, the Harriet was, in, in fact, the same horse, as we were saying, uh, with the saddle and bridle, all right? Um, doesn't seem like the rest of the equipment in this case, but um, we're talking about the ministerialis of the Count of Ar, specifically, not necessarily, like, there were different arrangements. We can imagine, of course, across Germany, things being relatively similar but not homogeneous across Germany, yet not identical because, of course, these relations were sort of um, ad personam sometimes. These were customs, which means that actually there was a community of ministerialis that was uh, a bit like a union, right? Um, a bit way to negotiate with a master, even within this you know, unequivocal uh, relation of, of disparity. And so uh, there was the sense of, of course, uh, individual, uh, individual ministerialis, as we will see now, had to be taken care of, uh, like the others, uh, etc. This was a privilege, but also duty, because you had, as we will see now, that by the same counts, you know, authority, the, the acceptance and the, the imposition of that as well. But I mean, the, the individual communities in this case and the, the local customs could vary from place to place, but more or less they were sort of um, the same. Um, this um, Harriet specifically is um, like the proof of like the Count's um, uh, maintenance of the possession, the control on the ministerialis mount. Right? It's not humiliating because it does not like entail the individual guy as such, but let's say the, the most... Um, say important like uh, mean of uh, of combat like the mounted one like the, not just the horse the saddle uh, the the bridle as the symbol of mounted warfare is definitely binding like it shows how um, strong the control of the count was even in a positive good sense for the for the protection of the ministerialist community in the R case. There was also the the ah the what what I was forgetting the ministerialis did not have just to have a, a thief right they could be living in under for example in the family of their own same clan right they may have not individually had a thief right they were just to serve because they were of that status and um, maybe I don't know the father as we'll see now also used to provide part of the equipment to their um, newly made. Um, uh, sons like as knights would be the the vassal um, on paper, better parchment at this point, and um, the uh, this guy again by dying, right, uh, was to reverse the just the, the 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 Harriet, right. This is interesting because it's exclusive, meaning that the thief in itself, when returning to the count, is. Uh, of course, at the ministerialis, that as a vassal is pretty much like what the entire vassalatic beneficiary system was meant to be in the first place. I mean, in spite of the entrenchment of the of of the nobility into their own prerogatives, the allodia. I think about how um, Frederick Barbarossa himself was would be fighting um, in this context against Henry the Lion. 
uh, for the, the Duchy of Saxony, etc. But the um, this is different because these are serfs, and so you have just because of the disparity of um, proportions, even though it's not quite this is happening because it's been negotiated with the same ministerialists to a degree, like the entire fief, n namely returning to the to the count at death, and if and this in itself, of course, was uh, a much bigger deal than the Harriet comparatively, so that when the, uh, of course, when you know somebody say comparatively like the Harriet was the case of a basal dying um, was of course also relatively to the entity of the thief was uh, relatively just like symbolical uh, in some way all right we don't even need to think of these mechanism to be so fiscal so tight but of course like it was an important um, uh, way just by custom to reaffirm the positive connection between the count and his ministerialis that of course were brought at war these people lived um, in the Arb Valley and they, they whenever the, the count was summoned for I don't know a royal imperial expedition or whatever they say Germany is complicated but generally speaking that the, the retinues of this guy they could have been sent uh, they would be sent for example in many um, Roman expeditions of, of Frederick Barbarossa into Italy, right? The, if you look at uh, Frederick's armies during the, the descents to Italy, they were mostly ministerialis of ecclesiastical fiefs. And in this case, you have the Archbishop of Cologne is so powerful and has other like lay um, vassals under him, but the ministerialis are a bit part of the same hierarchy, right? So uh, it would be a really like an adventurous life. Uh, and uh, remaining, like uh, establishing these customs, writing them down, um, uh, affirming the bond between your master and uh, your own community of ministerialis was a way to safeguard everybody involved. And these guys were, again, like the, the best uh, military professionals uh, in uh, in the country. So. Uh, they they had they really wanted to have them making good use of them. So there was the uh, possibility in which a ministerialis had would have had more than one thief, a, se a second one, let's say. Then the customers say that in that case, um, at the death of the ministerialis, the uh, value of the second fifth had to be paid back, it had to be restored, so if there were no heirs, so the value at that point of, of the fifth had to be appreciated by uh, the the other ministerialis in the right in the of, of the count of R, and in addition to the other one, the Harriet. This is interesting because it shows how Fundamentally, um, the more powerful ministerialists tended to be advantaged, right? They could be accumulating, like at least through uh, inheritance, more power if they're, uh, say, continuing like this power concentration if their family or had already held more fiefs, right? Na naturally, things could change easily on saying the same sort of. Um, uh, dynastic, we can say, principles. But it could be, of course, also the, uh, the situation of a ministerialist uh, dying without heirs of their own kind. So, as we've seen, no, do no uh, sons, no daughters, no brothers, no sisters. At that point, it would be their widows, their wives, uh, uh, to enjoy the usufruct of the thief which means of course that they were uh, to be maintained right as you know as uh, actually weak elements like the, the sense is that the widows the orphans etc were, were to be protected like medieval society was very clear about this and so in this case the widow was 
uh, by the the customs of our uh, provided with um, her uh, deceased uh, ministerialis husband uh, fee right just to sustain herself to maintain also the living conditions that as you understand we're not just okay this is a, a miserable pension this is like these guys were living as castellans as powerful people as vassals of some sort um, so this was considered say uh, congruent with the even just with the average of feudal feudal law for the free and this is we, we've seen it in many videos uh, the ones about the Bourbon or very often like with these dynasties it was normal for at the end of the day um, the husband's possession to be enjoyed in part right by the by the widow uh, in this case the the matter being however uh, usufructuary meaning that um, the widow did not really have a capacity to dispose of um, this usufruct, like of this thief, to, I don't know, alienate it to somebody else, right? This remained uh, to, uh, essentially, to the count of our um, dispositional discretion. And even if, for example, these women would... Uh, go on like as it often happened also considering uh, like marrying again considering that they use usually married um, quite young right and so it was not a rare eventuality of course if they were lucky however to survive um, uh, childbearing um, for them to remarry um, also multiple times for the same for the same reasons also these these guys again were most like they went at war. Life was pretty brutal and violent and and fragile in that sense. Um, but if these women had had would have children uh, by further marriages, the latter would not have uh, any right to the thief. The thief at that point had just been given in usufruct to the woman. Um, but at her death, it had to revert to the uh, comital power that would have at that point allocated it uh, to uh, whoever he so fit by another uh, negotium of some sort. New thieves given to young ministerialis who had died without any offspring, uh, which was not Again, the, it was normal like to have offspring most, most of the times. That's what all, basically the, the entire system was, was based on. That's why they, they married so young, etc. They tried to maximize like the, the entire fertility age. And also because, of, as we've seen in the other video about the female inheritance, we also talked about general mortality of the ministerialis. The, the results are quite brutal as, you know, still effective mechanism uh, to ensure this, the, all of this. But in that case... Um, the uh, faith given to this young uh, knight that would die in you know, any way would return completely to the count, right? So the hereditary rights were particularly relevant because there were a number of situations like of uh, links with, as we've seen, the, the family members that at that point would buy the custom house of the county of our um, ministerialis would be passed like would be acquired it was a, a very interesting aspect that it, I, I don't think it's it's very much discussed um, in general in history in pop history that is the especially in these cases the possibility of the um, hair, the, the ministerialis, being mentally um, inept, right? Mentally feeble, mad in some way or another. This was the case, for example, of Ulrich of Heisberg, right? Uh, a ministerialis who, who was insane, right? And he had brothers to look after him. And as we will see, uh, this was a very serious uh, situation because there is a sort of welfare system uh, that uh, were that was uh, was triggered by this this eventuality. Of course, in exchange for also the 
um, sort of the management of the same persons, mentally ill persons, um, uh, property, possession, right? So we do not have much info about the possible mental illness of these individuals. In some cases, I don't know, they, they could go insane for whichever. Again, they were pretty tough lives in the first place. Think about trauma in warfare. We talked about this recently for early modern soldiery. But we're talking sometimes even probably about mentally feeble uh, individuals who, yes, they were the hairs, they were those, also with the means of the time, you can imagine, uh, say, psychology was much simpler, right? If you worked, you were, uh, it was fine. Like, you didn't, you were, say, uh, forced until you, you made it work. But sometimes if you have some severe condition or problem, you may come of age and survive your, your father and your, your rights. And you're technically expected to be a ministerialist. But if you're incapable, uh, you're not going to at some point even to, to be able to manage uh, these thieves alone. And so at that point, the relatives would come around and already uh, sniff the possibility of starting to manage this property of the count. Let's stress this. Um, and uh, uh, by themselves, it's just orienting, like making their calculations in terms of like still other inheritance paths of how what's well, better patrimonially, strategically to to handle these thieves like and again it's not just a mere cold calculation that the, the thief was necessary for providing manpower uh the as we'll see now the fault there the the were all some there the were the communities like were leaving on them so everything from armor horses etc was connected to the affected in, in, the, in, in their availability to the effective management of the same thief um, so, in the case of uh, of a mentally unsound ministerialis, his thief would be, if he had one, of course, uh, which was say because as we've seen, it was not like a uh, a necessary condition. The thief was then de then delegated to another ministerialis. Delegated, meaning that you he would have taken care of that from the the mentally unsound guy. Um, this new ministerialis naturally would be, you know. A mentally sound person who could fulfill um, the services expected, right? Uh, so even in probably in the guy's stead, as far as, for example, military service was concerned, um, he had to maintain. However, and this was particularly relevant for the time, how modern the concept really was, the mentally ill, so that he could might not be accused of dishonorably neglecting his men. This is incredibly relevant because, again, the ministerialists had created the system for which if in you were... Uh, so you, th this is more subtle. It's not just about being sick or being, I don't know, uh, crippled. I mean, just think about well, you know, what could happen um, in mounted combat, the, the, the amount of people that would regularly be, I don't know, paralyzed, things like that. Um, and so for that, normally, everything was... Um, taken care of by the, the, the family, by the clan, by the system, right? This was absolutely normal. The problem with a mentally unsound individual, though, was that he was really maybe even capable of doing so many things, but not being able to judge, right? So there had to be this extra regulation to ensure the um, full legitimacy, first of all, in the establishment or the, the fact this person was mentally unfit, right? Because that could be subjected to some degree, of course, of, um, you know, somebody had to decide that, right? And this was not done by doctors. Uh, it was done in a sort of communal sense, together with the count, whatever. So, so of course, somebody was to be consulted. Um, but the idea is that it had to be officialized, because otherwise... Without that, uh, people could say, but that guy still orders something and, uh, you know, whose right is that to do so? Who does have to bait? No, okay, at that point, you recognize the guy is mentally unsound. And yes, you will take over his place. You will manage it on his behalf. And the guy is hard, like, say hardly to return or become able in, in the first place. Because how do you fix a situation like this? 
um, and that had to be established once for all. Um, I think that this case regulated also like dementia, like age, things like that. I mean, we know of ministerialists that participated to tournaments when they were uh, 80 years old, right? But these were like, first of all, life was normally shorter, but even when, I mean, not with enormous difficulty, people would reach that age, of course, they were some t they would at some point go with, with their hands. Uh, and so you had to take matter in, in your own hands in, in ways that, I don't know, was sometimes even just, um, you know, and say practical, like uh, just like today, like when somebody gets old and their children start taking care of them that may even make him sign when he's not really that aware or even signing for them, like for decisions, etc. So if this was following the, the natural course, there was really nothing that I think anybody would have complain about it. unless of course we're talking about um inheritance issues maybe i don't know my father told me that i could have this or that but this was not much the case of the ministerialis um well in part yes but let's say their inheritance as we've seen was tendentially much more regulated um and uh that is uh what around uh revol uh the, the majority of issues, uh, of, say, in any legal circumstance, fundamentally revolt. Like, it's a patrimonial issue, first and foremost, of thieves, of land, right, of, of assets. Uh, but it's interesting, the fact that the ministerialis who had been entrusted with the care uh, of the mentally feeble would have been considered like a, you know, a dishonorable individual had he essentially just let not taken care about this person so there was a an esprit de corps that was substantiated not just in a brutal okay well this guy is going so we don't consider him these were knights right doesn't matter how servile uh, juridically they had a honor they had a sense that uh, um, god's imperium after all uh, was have, they had been bestowed upon them to some degree, as they say, they bore the sword and the chingulum militaris. Um, and as such, like there was a sense of dignity connected with their with their knightly office, which uh, considered also the, the fact that a person would who did not, um, you know, work too well after all, uh, was part of a broader group, of a broader body, of a broader soul, that had to make the effort just to, to support him, even in his individual, um, uh, in fact, condition, right, individual rights. The thieves carried, as we've seen with them, military ob obligations to support the Count of Ah on campaign, and the same Count's lords. Right, the Archbishop of Cologne and the Holy Roman Emperor hierarchically, and this is quite fascinating because, as you know, the uh, the, the clergy, especially the German one, was uh, fairly militarized. Right, uh, actually, and possibly the most militarized in in Europe in a systemic sense. Um, and the Archbishop of Cologne was, you know, a hell of a power uh, in his own his own kind. But of course, the um, say especially that process of privatization and feudalization of the German episcopate was not um, yet so pronounced to become dysfunctional, and even turning his back um, the the Holy Roman Emperor himself, as it happened in the 13th century, we've seen it in the dispute between Philip uh, of Swabia and Otto of Brunswick. Um, but in this sense. Uh, say lay power uh, was not just stronger more militarized and that's why the, the church had been protecting the um uh, and been backing the 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 whole the, the kingdom right the, the public authority and getting protected in return in this sense the latter mechanism had consisted in providing 
the the emperor with ministerialis as we were saying before here it's a bit different because um the county of r is probably a county run by a layman right but there are ministerialis that are properly fostered by the same archbishop of cologne uh, and they and the other ecclesiastical lords right and as we will see now actually the uh, the ministerialis of R were very much connected with the um, archiepiscopal power of Cologne, as far as probably their their recognition uh, was was concerned. Right? There was um, general uh, duty of the ministerialis of the county of R to be ready at all times. Right, and not just for uh, foreign expeditions, let's say, but to garrison his castles, for example. So fulfilling both duties at the count's uh, expense. And uh, there was, in fact, an umbrella of, you know, subsidies or protections of, 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 like, they couldn't be otherwise. Like, even that the ministerialists were servants, they had to be protected by their own lord to be able to perform their duty as well. Um, for example, uh, this was very important in medieval Europe. Think about the rest hour, right, in the Provencal or Italian legislation. Like when horses were lost, uh, not just in combat, right, but in the count's service, it was the count who had to replace them for the ministerialis, right? So horses, as you know, were dramatically expensive at so many levels, and especially the war ones. Um, and there was all an insurance system that, generally speaking, the, the various communities had put together. Um, in this case, the guy who actually has the wealth is the count. Uh, and so he's the one who takes on himself this, uh, these costs. Uh, remember the Harriet before. Like the, the idea is that if, you, if you're just like a, you, uh, like a, you know, ministerialis, as, as a basis, you owe as a life like your your horse to the to the count uh, on a regular basis and so in this case the the count had to in life supply you with horses right horses are very resilient animal but they get crippled very easily right and so everybody's very concerned about this uh in the middle ages now as um at cologne there was a uh, an event a formal probation for the young ministerialis that in other words were made on that occasion uh, this was just like the field of of of, of mars and of Ma of may actually um in um the in the mindset of this post carolingian reality in which um you had just to send these guys out to train with one another this was especially by the mid uh, 12th century becoming the conditio sine qua non these guys could just go at war because by now like essentially western frankish feudalism was being fully um grafted uh, on the german society and politics especially in the rhineland that naturally was one of the most advanced areas was closer to france uh, so it had it easier in general to foster even this large military retinues right uh, so these guys would meet at Cologne and they would also exhibit um, this you know typical like tournaments uh, you know collective maneuvers that's how they they acquired that uh, capacity in the first place it was a very important moment for which the youth was provided by their fathers their outfits Right, so the ministerialis would, of course, provide uh, the armament for their sons uh, as well. This was actually seen even as a privilege, even if it was a cost in the ministerialis, it was giving like a sense of these are, like we are arming them, we are um, autonomously fostering our kids to become the next generation of, of professional soldiers. Uh, and of course they were in part protected by the same count so in the process this was very um, convenient 
and not even just for a few. In fact, the count specifically would find the food for the young ministeriales and especially the winter fodder for their horses. All right? The latter especially was a huge deal because it doesn't matter how young these and sort of athletic, energetic these guys had to be. The um, diet of a human being is nothing in comparison to the, you know, unnecessarily excessive amount of water and fodder that, that a war horse consumes and that once you picture by scale like you realize how radically overly advanced medieval logistics actually was for basing their armies on this uh, the, si the size of uh, mounted arms so um, this was a huge gift that the count made for this youth when going to Cologne and um, like the the winter fodder was collected just for this happened in spring so they um, there was all a specific and it was meant also to be so, sort of the best fodder in a way because it had to be consumed early in the season so it had had to have particular qualities and at that point uh, you would also have it stored right we talked about the role of reserves in manorial society in warfare um, and naturally the count had a great deal of control in this because could also keep better the same ministerialis under control now the count dietrich von haar would grade in the customs the fines for any misdemeanor right uh, his ministerialis had to be disciplined obedient lawful uh, again controllable for example breaching the costume itself was like uh, 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 really a, a, a bad thing to say at least a sin a crime it entailed the expulsion from the same retinue and the fellow knights were expected to treat uh, this uh, ministerialis fallen out of grace as literally a criminal a felon right and so that he would lose his honor this tells you how stringent actually the obedience owed to the count really was but again these are military men they're obliged to serve faithfully uh, loyally and so if they can't even you know accept the, the basics of, of the story of course they are to be treated like lesser human beings and possibly also taken out in some way uh, which was in part even like it, it would have been painful especially if you were connected to this person this happened for some reason but there was objectively no good one just to to complain in that sense especially in an individual point of view right you were part of a group this is just like a huge uh, again it's a big mob it's like a union that uh, fosters its own sense of cohesion right and these are all people trained also in the sound the most atrociously violent rites of initiation uh, for this kind of like for being ministerialis themselves right we're talking the, the eastern frankish kingdom in the in the mid 12th century we're talking about certain practices of, of, of you know again of training of like descending straight from the war bands that these guys fundamentally are just the evolution of there are utterly, you know, uh, insane, from, at least compared to our sort of very cheap, soft, and objectively disgusting sub-moral standards in the 21st century. Um, these people really had, like, the, the resistance, the kind of the, the immediate, like, uh, accessibility to the, to the capacity of of killing and getting killed to, to an extent you have no idea from not talking about the physicality that as impressive as it may have been it uh, it's like just the last of, of the of the issues compared to the moral dimension that they were mastering also in a spiritual sense um, so if you betray the custom all you're done for and it's pretty obvious um, naturally the ministerialists were not for this reason particularly uh, sensitive individuals again they would defend their own uh, feeble minded but just because it was 
theirs, right? So it was an incredibly, again, sort of mafia style, protective, in internally dealt with issue. Except when this endangered the group, and for example, um, like a ministerialist killing another ministerialist, which would occur, again, these people were not particularly, um, sometimes even properly accustomed to the difference between a peaceful and, and a violent life. Um, they would also fall uh, into actually the like into the hands of the count. There was, of course, the possibility of an excuse, like if a ministerialis was judged to have done something particularly bad and out of revenge. Um, as it happened, just like in for Freeman, like you wanted to kill someone, there was a heavily fine uh, a penalty, um, but you could be in that sense absolved. Uh, for, for a good cause, uh, as there could be many. I mean, today we would think self-defense, but there are other sins, other crimes that at the time are considered like, I don't know, you sleep with my wife, like I'm just going to catch you both. Um, that, like, yeah, that's kind of normal. This occurred even uh, to some degree of legislation, even in first world countries until, you know, a couple of generations ago. Um, uh, so the... This depends. In any case, if there was no good reason, and the discretion uh, was, of course, uh, depending on like a fair share of public uh, advice, but mostly on the count, again, uh, the latter would take the matter in his own hands, right? And uh, he would also put these guys to death. Needless to say, uh, even in the case in which these guys were just uh, falling out of grace and not killed, they would lose uh, by law, right, the comital protection as well as their thieves. So it was not just like a great move. They could be reintegrated, uh, but the ministerialis would have had something to say about that as well. If, say, um, they had been damaged by this guy and said so the count wanted to reintegrate him, uh, they would would have opposed themselves um, with some you know, awareness from the count side, right? Um, there was in the, like in this customs, um, a, a law which contemplated that um, those ministerialists who would despoil the count's property were fined uh, two pounds. Uh, this naturally, I think, uh, had uh, like w was sort of the the general fine in addition to restoring that property, right? Uh, the same pa uh, amount of pounds was um, um, was exacted by those who oppressed their fellow ministerialists. So, in other words, if there was one of these de facto lords. At the heads of a thief that was sort of um, abusing of his power, trying to coerce weaker ministerialists on the basis of his uh, of his power, like the the count will intervene. Naturally, uh, these laws uh, show how, for just issuing the the cast the, the customers, that these um, these problems were there. Right, these things did happen. Right, we have seen in other videos and hinting at before how uh, to how the ministerialists could live even with a very wide degree of autonomy um, uh, from uh, from the Lord. Right, even just in terms of distances. Right, there there could be uh, like a momentary uh, incapacity of the count to be there, right, and exercising justice also with his own men and other ministerialists, right, so you had to just understand what had happened locally in case of these problems, because it was, it was like justice was a serious thing, it wasn't so immediate, like, what, what had really happened and why, right. Um, there was a pretty uh, effective way of ensuring, however, the, the, the execution of the counts 
uh, deliberations in as much as the ministeriales were to um, in fact exact uh, the uh, the fine of which they would um, uh, keep two thirds right so the, the count would keep one third of the fine and, and the rest was enough to launch the other ministerialis to this kind of um, chase of the uh, and, and punishment of, of the criminals there are many instances of that before we we mentioned, for example, the struggle between Philip of Swabia and Otto of Brunswick. As you know, Philip was assassinated shortly after having been elected king of Germany for reasons that had nothing to do with politics. Telling the truth, it was a, just a personal feud with a guy that had also nothing to do with Otto of Brunswick that, however, rose to the throne. And actually, um, there was a general consensus in Germany that the killer had to be chased and taken down and it's the ministerialis that, that carried this out they they chase him if i'm not wrong until bavaria close to the danube and they take his uh like they cut his head off and again the ministerialis were all about this right exercising violence they were the uh the iron arm of the great part of these authorities right and their deal was exactly also uh, intimidating uh, the uh, the competitors of the uh, the emperor within within Germany's our authorities keeping order just uh, through their deterrence knowing what kind of men they, they were by profession in the our customals we have unspecified offenses for the lesser issues that could be compounded, for example, by fines of five shillings to the count. We find brawls, which the knights uh, could pull each other's hair or eat each other. That was more serious. Uh, the fine was one pound, and this tells you how... Uh, this doesn't sound too, you know, different from Tacitus' description of sort of the, the Germanic holes while you know a bit too much uh, beer or wine in this case of the Arbale, um, they, they would have drank because uh, again these guys were really like people that realistically you would have not liked to, to be too close to in, in general like they were incredibly at least depending on who they were they were incredibly violent people but I mean incredibly violent people um, there is all a there is a playlist dedicated to the history of violence, and I think a couple of um, videos were dedicated already just to at least medieval Germany, explaining what that world was. Um, uh, pulling somebody else's hair was particularly important, like peoples like the Germans, the, the Poles, but okay, the Westerners in, uh, uh, in general thought that, of course, beauty was a moral value, like this was part of the the traditional belief especially knights were thought to embody the most that sort of spring um, you know virility and perfection and uh, strength and, and and virtue and hair was in many ways just like the symbol of virility uh, in part and so pulling that was seen as a terrible affront just like I don't know pulling uh, somebody's horse's tail or you know stealing a sword or something like this it was just uh, a matter of honor that you could simply not like it was a way of um, pulling somebody's beard or or hair was a way to just emasculating them and proving that they were sort of good for nothing in fact it, the mere fact it could be done right so there were real issues deriving from these um, incidents it's sometimes started out of you know, very silly reasons, right? As it always happens, like on average, uh, in society, at some point. Um, for uh, this fine of one pound, the guilty party was convicted by two other knights, either ministerialis or liberi, that is freeman. In the second case, this really depended on like the circumstance who was there there were free knights free people who were 
living in this territory. So that's um, that really depended on the the situation. Now speaking of Count Dietrich of Ha, he left no direct heirs, which means that the actual um, rulers of the Ha became the uh, counts of Nuremberg and Hochstaden. Now these were indirect heirs of his. The, the connection is not so important as much as what actually changed in the relation between these counts and the ministerialis. First of all, the counts of Nürburg and Hochstaden decided to hold the county of Ar uh, in common. Right, so this included the castle uh, of Ar, the ministerialis, and pretty much all the appurtenances. Right, so um, this was like a common thing to have a shared uh, lordship over a single county, right? This was just worked out with the Archbishop of Cologne. It's sort of really normal, it's not so important in itself, right? There were some changes, however, um, during the the generation, right? In the relation between the count, these two counts, uh, and the um, and in fact the the R uh, as such. Uh, needless to say, um, the counts of Nuremberg and Hochstaden, at least in their uh, own uh, counties, that w in which they were better established, would not be as present as uh, at Dietrich's uh, hand in the local issues. So these are not great distances. But there is still some sort of, you know, say, hunningment, as we will see now, of the uh, the situation. Because these two counts see the one, uh, the, the county of Ar, as a bit of a, you know, secondary um, place where they can enjoy certain, certain privileges and they... Uh, even against what had been the previous customs, and so they have to negotiate this a bit with the same ministerial as they leave them some some other autonomies in exchange. So this naturally happens over the generations, as we were saying before, we arriving at the beginning of the 13th century. You uh, you have a bit more of an arrangement of the situation. Germany starts becoming a bit more turbulent again, and uh, the the local resources have increased just as the say the the, pri the power of the privates and so also uh, the general uh, like the ministerialists have kept increasing power themselves right and so there are stronger relations in, in, in a way also in terms of conflictuality now these sons of the uh, aforementioned counts the ones we inherited uh, Dietrich's um, uh, comital rights. We're talking again their sons, respectively, the Count Gerhard of Nuremberg and the one uh, Lothar of Orchstaden, renewed. That's how we know how the thing went. The um, arrangement of uh, the shared seigniory between each other, as their fathers had done before them, and so regulating in part also what was happening in uh, in the Valley of Ar, specifically the ones garrisoning the duty in Ar. We're talking uh, here, the, the arrangement is 1202, but we know that by 1214, um, six families of ministerialis garrisoned Ar. This gives you a dimension of, of the of the quantity, right? And we are talking, by the way, about the the same burgraves and seneschals of Har. It could be yes, ministerialis. We've seen it also in other um, in other videos, such as the ones about the the Bavarian feud, for instance. Um, so this arrangement, uh, this updating, reflects in part the need to strengthen. Um, the military control over the centralized position 
and privileging those ministeriales that are uh, already adapted to, to that role in the sort of key areas as we've seen there was already a right right to um, you know favor uh, the um, so the ministeriales would hand more fees uh, right and these would be sort of the easier to, to bet on uh, in terms of providing some you know more collectively organized military readiness the thieves dependent upon these offices were um, changed uh, in the arrangement in terms of inheritance rights of the ministerialis. Now they could, compare to what we have seen in Dietrich's times, to descend to sons, daughters, or near relatives of either sex without, however, Harriet's being charged. This is also interesting. In other words, they were saying to these guys, okay, we do not need this sort of succession tax. We know that you are the ministerialis of our. We want rather those horses to be saved for it was a, an ancestral law, etc. But the, now the discounts are treating the ministerialis a bit more as uh, not peers, evidently, because they were still disposing of them. Um, but they were sort of favoring their entrenchment in the Art Valley uh, in order to. To just have a more uh, directly, say, a, a, a more sound connection with the single uh, hands. Right? In times again, they were not easy at all. In this, um, in this picture again, the think about the Archbishop of Cologne, Adolf of Altena. Here again, we are exactly in those moments in which the same. Archbishop of, um, of of Cologne is moving a bit away, even from the 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 public, um, uh, let's say the imperial authority, the, the royal authority. And you want to say make things work a bit more smoothly. Uh, in, in many ways, even having less, but with more guarantees of that. The knightly garrison of the Har Valley, by the way, was granted with the right to hunt in the Har Forest and to be buried in the Har Churchyard. Right. So um, this is yet another concession. If one of the counts was accused of injuring a ministerialis, the other count was called to judge the case. Right. This also shows, like, the fact that if they issued this law, it's because there was some fear of abuse and also some sort of um, uh, guarantee that the ministerialists wanted in terms of protection. Meaning, say, if you two guys coalize to um, uh, abuse us, right, to oppress us in some way, we we want instead written that one of the two will come to judge the other so that we have some like we can properly we have the right of accusing the count of um, at that point uh, having injured one of us this tells you how after all as we were just saying like powerful these ministerialists had sort of become in relative terms um, they were gentrifying as you understand there is something more given that they were living as aristocrats right um, uh, conversely ministerialis accused of injuring the counts that could claim that to have happened were to go under trial in the castle of a the locality was important to stress that there was uh, a justice administered locally by the proper lordly authority of the county in the castle, etc. And so, in the same place where the the the, the imperium of this uh, district had to concretize in, and so also a central place where the ministerialis would be present, even but whereas the counts had to come from somewhere else, where they had to send some advocates from from the outside, right? And the convicted offenders, so the ministeriales found guilty 
of having attacked, uh, injured the cows, were obliged to, they were given a chance essentially to regain grace within a year and a day. So an entire cycle after which you could be renewed, right? And at that point you can imagine what kind of effort these guys would have done, like to provide with compensation, with services, with something like that, was of course discretional to the count, because at that point, uh, after that, we're actually not told by uh, the documents, but they would have been uh, at least expelled from the uh, from the nightly retinue, and so they would have lost their relevance, their rights, their protection. Um, and so as serfs, they would have, um, we've seen also how in front of the other ministerialists, they would have been considered like, like felons, right? They, at that point, they, once the thing had been established, like there was nothing you could do. Um, and uh, as a serf out there, especially this time, and being considered a felon, uh, things would have not been particularly easy right, for you. But you understand here towards the 13th century is some sort of adjustment of the uh, sort of the, uh, there is actually an autonomization of this ministerialis. Uh, and uh, one that probably also um, underlines the otherwise uh, uh, impossibility like imposing even oneself too much on them right there are some things that are mm, really re generally you know this greater uh, freedom this greater at least of movement and uh, a greater uh, importance even of those ministerialists that were to garrison the castle over the others so looking some, something more solid right it was not run locally by the by the counts again not too far away but in a way that they would like to like to like as vassals those ministerialists had to provide military service so provide other things so that was cashed, and they said, okay, well, do a bit what you want, strengthen your own power there, um, but just let's keep things working the way uh, they go. Like, and this is, say, very interesting, and it shows how, again, relevant and, um, and functional the ministerialist system really was. Right? We'll look at many different examples because um, there really are in a, in a, in Germany especially uh, like you you don't have too much like even like you would like for some other places right but um, you um, you still have like the the centrality of the ministerialis to a degree which uh, allows to them to be recognized um, and uh, let's say appreciated on the basis of um, the same the same documentation right it's it's not that um, okay you, you can perceive the pre eviness of these mechanisms in the moment in which they um, they are some of the, the few things that sort of are documented uh, at a point right so it's extremely important and we will be seeing this more right at some other point in detail of course for today however I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.